खंडमंडलाकारम व्याप्तम येन चराचरम तत्पदम दर्शितम येन तस्मे श्री गुरुय नम अज्ञानतिमिरांदस्यजनानजन सदाकय चक्षुर्मृतम येन तस्मे श्री गुरुय नम गुरुर्ब्रह्मा गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात ब्रह्म तस्मे श्री गुरुय नम नमस्कार वेलकम टू द सत्संग I am not going to give a speech. This is a satsang, okay? Mm. So uh, keep it informal as a satsang. Don't make it into a lecture. Before we start, I also offer my salutations to Swami Shivananda Mahaprabhu Maharaj, one of the twelve direct disciples of Sri Ram Krishna. Respects are due to him also because. Swami Tapasyananda, who gave me the Ram Krishna mantra during my sadhana period, was his disciple. <coughs> so, from there the lineage goes to Thakur. So, Oriya to nahi aata hai. Mangla ek to ek to jani, bhalo kare jani na. So, we need to use some common language. language so let me start with a question which i used to often ask myself to so i used to ask with this question when i was still very young what is the purpose of the life that we live doesn't occur to young people generally i'm i'm happy that there are young people here now which means sketching up in those days when i was young there was hardly a young person unlike now there are many young people sitting here when if you grow a beard you look young don't worry well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um today things have changed and things have changed because of the great work done by a great many sadhaks and great many yogis during this interim period which is from the time when i was say 9 or 10 to now i'm 72 hmm? 72 young 72 you can say 27 <laughs> so we this question now many youngsters are beginning to ask what is the purpose of life why are we living like this every day we see people living getting jobs getting married having children if you ask uh, anybody's history keep asking oh he was born very poor okay great not good or bad but great and then he worked very hard and then uh, he did this he did that he joined the cotton business or whatever in calcutta yes those days and so on then you keep asking them then he became a big man and then he became this then he donated to hospital then he, okay. you keep asking them then he died <laughs> Ask the same question on another person. History. He became this. He became that. Then he became the president of India. Keep asking. Then, then he died. Right. So, the question that occurs, if one is having even a little bit of intelligence, is if this is the end, what is the use? Ah, enter a period you can enjoy. I understand. Is that really enjoyment out there? Or? So, this question of where we are going, what we are doing, what is the aim of life, is something. If you are not thinking about, we should start thinking about. I am not saying you should change your robes or you should change your. That that's up to you. Different people can do sadhana only in different ways. Or that I'm not even saying that you should not get married. Or I'm not saying you should get married. 
these are irrelevant. As long as the question lasts, where am I going? What am I doing? Is this the end of life? If I become an expert in uh, what you call internet digital networking, will I be stopped from death? Is that a great achievement, or I think? Or, and so on. Now the strange thing, which is so simple, is that since ancient times, the Supreme Being has been defined as Satchidananda. You go to any of the texts of ancient times, especially the Rantik texts, the Supreme Being is called Satchidananda. Why have they used that term? Because Sat means, you know what is Sat? What? Tell me, no, you see that? Satsang. Reality. Huh? reality. Which exists all the time. True or real? Well. Can, uh, real. Sat. Sat, the word Sat in Sanskrit means, on one hand, it's a reality. On the second, it is therefore the truth, because that which cannot be real cannot be the truth. It also means permanent. Anything that is impermanent cannot be lasting truth. It's temporary, coming and going. This is Sat. Now, this is the name or word used for the supreme reality, which is the essence of the universe and therefore also the essence of our being. Sat. And this essence is further defined by the word Chit, which means it is not an inanimate thing, but it is of the nature of consciousness, Prajna. Hmm. This is why the Upanishads, one of the Mahavakyas is Prajnanam Brahma. Prajna, consciousness. And what is its innate quality? If you want to call it a quality, what is the innate essence or tangible understanding of this reality. Sat is difficult to know. Why? Because we are all the time in Asat. That which is not permanent, which is not real. So when you say Sat, it's only an idea. Yeah. Chit, of course, we are conscious. But when we say Chit consciousness, we mean only conscious of something. Not conscious of oneself. I mean, one self means, yes, I am M, this God is there, but that also I don't have much. But deeper down, my consciousness, when I am not identified with anything at all of the external world, name, form, therefore Chit, little more understandable. We are all conscious of something or the other. And to be conscious of something, I have to be conscious. And the unconscious body is not conscious of anything. So there is some understanding that we get. Talking of you and me, okay? I'm not separating myself from you. Last word, Ananda, is something that the human mind can at least to some extent tangibly understand. Because we are all looking for it. In some way. The whole of life, why do we lead? Or if it's a misery, would we lead the life? No, because we are looking for some form of happiness somewhere. Not the ultimate, somewhere. Now the Upanishads say, the ancient teachers say, that that ananda which you are looking for, that completeness that you are looking for, that purnata that you are looking for, purnamata, is also here in you, Purnam Idam. Although 
in general consciousness we think that we are incomplete it is because we think we are incomplete that we are trying to complete i think if i have one house i am happy then i find not enough then i have two houses maybe i am happy finally i have five houses and total unhappiness descends but why am i aiming for that because i think by expanding i can become more complete why because deep down in my mind there is a remembrance that in true essence i am purna and the quality of that purna is ananda happiness not the ordinary happiness which comes in goes i don't have to say in calcutta it's like heaven to eat some of the sandesh made here sandesh rasgulla all nice you get some joy out of it but it doesn't last long and if you had too much in law you have to go to the toilet in 10 minutes it's gone bad stomach that is also joy so man human being has a propensity towards joy towards happiness which is naturally built in because the mind is longing to find that ananda which is anantam anandam brahma as the prashna describes it so the search is perfectly legitimate many youngsters want to have that fine i understand But the direction is not so accurate we could only reverse the direction and find the source inside us which is the source of all joy which has no end that happiness has no end this is the meaning of satchidananda now in the vedanta sutra samvyasa don't worry i'm not going to go into too much vedanta as a reference point same sachinananda is described in another term which term is even more easily understandable by us than the term sachinananda vyasa calls defines that supreme reality the brahma sutras as asti bhadi priya <coughs> asti bhadi priya now asti means that which is always in contrast to things that we know in this world which are there today and gone tomorrow which are not only existence but modifications of existence asti means pure existence which is always there no matter the modification comes or goes outside in bhati it is self effulgent it does not need any light from outside by itself it is effulgent and consciously effulgent bhati last is priya i always tell people it's better to start your understanding from priya and go towards bhati and asti because asti and bhati are still not so easily understandable priya is understandable what is priya something is dear to me the child the mother for, for the mother the child is dear this beautiful dialogue between erna valke and maitri his wife in the brihadaranya upanishad where he says oh maitri when you say you love your son actually you are loving the essence inside you when you say you love the husband or the wife by the way actually what is happening is you are moving towards that propensity of priya which is the essence of being so priya is something we can understand love affection the essence of which in pure form is called bhakti and difficult to define and less experience than form even in the in when priya or affection or 
love manifests itself in ordinary things. It is difficult to define. How is it possible to define it in its ultimate state? There is a young man who falls in love with a young girl. He is ready to leave everything and go if the girl agrees to go with him. What is the sacrifice feeling coming from? Priya. And two young people in the bus stop come out of college, standing there, not speaking a word, looking at each other for half an hour. You ask them what is happening. Yeah, we don't know. Kuch kuch hota hai. <laughs> Kya hota hai? Samaj nahi hai. This is the lower manifestation of Priya. Because of which this whole world exists. Creation exists, evolution exists. We are saying the essence of that is the love towards the divine, which is the essence of Ananda, which is inside each one of us, in our hearts. So, if only we turn the direction and look within, probably find the essence. I mean, this is the ultimate teaching that has been given to us. And then, as Swami Vivekananda quoting, the Vedas Upanishad said, you become Amrtasya Buddha, sons and daughters, he didn't say, but daughters, of immortality. Why? Because that essence in us neither is born nor therefore does it die. Because anything that is born has to die. Anything. Anything created has to get destroyed. Anything born has to die. In us is a spark of the divine which is in existence from time immemorial. The only thing is if you remove the conditionings and see that is what your true identity is, then you have become Amrita. Amrita is not, uh, Amrit is not what is given as prasad. Very sweet, mixed with honey. It is sweet, of course. Amrita in Sanskrit, Amrityu. Where you touch that which is deathless, which is your true essence, your true self. This is the entire teaching. Therefore, as the Bhagavad Gita says, at the end of each chapter, the Gita also teaches the same thing. It is the essence of the Upanishad. It says, this is the Srimad Bhagavad Gita Aiki, Srimad Bhagavad Gita Asu. What does it teach? Upanishads. What does the Upanishad teach? Brahma Vidyayam. Now, now we discussed something, theoretically. But is it possible to find that simply by saying, in true essence we are that supreme being which is full of joy. We can say that, repeat that, feel that. But the body and mind must be made ready to receive it. This is when the next word occurs, Yoga Shastri. When you say Yoga Shastri, it need not necessarily mean Ashtanga Yoga. Need not. Need not mean that you should, without standing on your head, you cannot find the Divine. That doesn't mean. That's also one of the Yogas, of course. Yoga actually means how the process by which the mind is deconditioned. Now from the conditioning it has been exposed to from birth, even from previous births, if you believe in it. I do. And when you, this illusion which has been given to us, saying that I am a limited human being, the best way to get rid of this is through the practice of yoga. Now when you say yoga, it could mean Patanjali's yoga, it could mean Bhakti yoga, it could mean Karma yoga, it could mean Jnana yoga, but a technique, something is required to decondition the mind and free us from its limitations so that what the Upanishads teach, the Brahma Vidya, can be received. Otherwise, 
the instrument that we have as it is is not ready to receive it's not fit it needs to be cleaned the vessel has to be cleaned before it is received and the whole process of cleaning is called sadhana sadhana can be of any kind i know many people be thinking of kriya yoga because that is my parampara but my sonat baba ji always asked this question when somebody went to him because it's not a shortcut there is no shortcut in this field he used to say what kriya yoga did mera bhai practice tell me or what kriya did thakur practice What Kriya did Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa? Maybe he did some practices afterwards, but what, where did he start from? And on the other hand, the other extreme, what Kriya did Ramana Maharshi practice? So it's not as if only if you practice Kriya, and that to the particular Kriya that I'm talking about, one would reach fulfillment. That's not true. There are various other things. Otherwise, even the practice of kriya will become a merely mechanical practice. I can sit every day and breathe in and out. The bellows of the blacksmith also do that. But if there is no life to it, there is no bhava and bhakti to it. It's merely a breathing exercise. Even gymnasts do it. So. These are the things which we need to look into. So, sadhana is very important. Do not think that if you keep on repeating every day, I am the essence of the supreme being. You are going to become the essence of the supreme being. When all everything is over, then only it shines forth. And that reviewing of the different layers and beings that are on top. This is the practice of sadhana. and different people according to the temperaments backgrounds and i would also add past births do different kinds of sadhanas the question is not what kind of sadhana you do but with how much attention and uh, dedication you do it and how patient one is because there are no shortcuts So this is the meaning of sadhana. Now, take that. I'm going to give you a few examples of people from different categories who did their sadhana and found out the truth. They were in Calcutta, so you know the history of Sri Ram Krishna Paramahamsa. I don't even have to say it. He was a young man. Who refused to go to school because he said, "I don't want any profit-making education." Not a message to the youngsters. Yeah, he is a man who was almost unlettered, barely could sign his name. And how did his spiritual career start? What was his sadhana? Where did he start? He started worshiping the mother goddess Kali with all love and affection. With instead of thinking of it as just an image he thought of it as a reality seen in the image in front of him there are people who say god is all pervading how uh, is a nice dialogue mahendranath gupta who is already popular in most places as sri am even before i became him he One day, left his home because he was very angry. Married man, as you said, had a fight with the wife and uh, left in a huff. Somebody had told him that uh, there is a garden in Dakshineshwar, nice place. It's a Kali temple. There's a nice place, and there is some Paramahamsa living there. And so on and so forth. So go there, and you might feel at peace. 
He was from the Brahma Samaj, so he was not very happy with the Kali temple and Paramahamsa and all that. So he said, nice garden, so let's go. He got into the horse buggy <laughs> and they went. Exactly when they reached the Dakshin, when he neared Dakshinishwar, he said, I'm not going into this nonsense. I will just go somewhere else. Exactly when they reached Dakshinishwar, the axle broke to go to Gadi. So he decided now what to do. Got off the road, went to the garden. Garden was much better those days than what it is now. I hope it is revived. He went in and he sat on a bench. Nice and peaceful. Suddenly he saw a man coming towards him. The man was, you would have seen only those pictures of Sri Ramakrishna with a beard and so on. Those days he used to clean shave, but only once in a while for the beard grew. So that day he just had a shave. He had a, he had a round, uh, perfect, healthy, shining face. Anybody, if you stood up in a crowd, people would have, they won't know who, but they would have said, who is this? So, and it was winter, so he was wearing a shirt and a black coat, bandhgala. And the, the long Bengali dhoti with the red border, nicely tied. And nicely polished brown duties. And he just had some pan. So his lips were red. Okay. He saw this man sitting there, Mahindranath Gupta. Mahindranath Gupta, as usual, they greeted each other. Hmm. He stood up, then sit down. And he asked, So, do you believe, sudden question, in God with form or without form? He was taken aback. Suddenly somebody springs a question at you. He said, I am from the Brahma Samaj, so I believe in the formless. Okay. He said, but your formless God, is he all pervading? Or does he live in some special place? No, sir, we are all pervading. If he is all pervading, see the temple there, there is Kali there, image of Kali. He must be there also inside, right? Nobody had asked him this question before. He didn't know what to say, what to reply. If he is all pervading, it cannot be that he will avoid only the image and be everywhere else. He said, yes, he is there also. Ah, okay, I just wanted to ask you. He said. Then M asked him, I heard there is a Paramahamsa staying here. He said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, come again, he said. And he came back. When he came back, his one thought in mind was, I want to go back there. Get caught in all this. I'm not going back. Kali Temple is there. Never went for a long time. A poor man could free himself only on Sundays. The rest of the days were working days for him. He was headmaster in the school. So one Sunday he decided to go. No, just before he came. If you go to Dakshineshwar on the left side, you will see small room, you all know that, where he used to sleep, live, talk, all the young boys like this used to join there. I don't know whether young girls came on, but in <laughs> young boys, they all used to sit around and uh, talk. And in fact, many of the people around used to complain, this man is spoiling this boy, they are not going to college, they are cutting classes and coming here and sitting. What is he teaching? He is telling jokes, eating them, rasgulla, spitting them, what is happening here? Anyway, they had a good time and they learned. Those are the guys who later on became stalwarts like Swami Vivekananda, Mahapurush Maharaj, Swami Brahmananda, many. 
with those rasgullas, they went up. <laughs> so, he, he was sitting and talking, it was a Sunday. Then he suddenly said, you know, I'll tell you a story. There was a priest in a temple who used to mix opium, you know what is opium, afim, in the milk, which they gave us prasad. One day a peacock came there and drank the milk. Then every day at that exact time, that peacock used to come and drink the milk. So they didn't know what he was saying because very often, sometimes they could not understand. He would refer to something which they could not place. So they kept quiet. Then there he looked out and he said, Oh, the peacock is coming. <laughs> oh. M entered. Everybody started laughing. All the boys. He didn't know. He sat down humbly, listened to it. And that day he didn't write anything. But after some days he started taking notes, which later on became the gospel of Ramakrishna. So they are only Sunday notes, remember. If you want to know what is not there in the gospel, you need to read Sarasanandas. Ramakrishna, the great master. It is all time. This is Sunday recording. So, in fact, later on, he decided that he would be an official biographer because every now and then he used to ask, did you note that down? No. So, the peacocks, so they all laughed. Then after it was over, and they were going out. He asked the boys, why are you laughing? Do I look like a joker? They said, this is the story. He said, the peacock will come just five minutes ago. And you appeared. So we laughed. He said, ah, the peacock has come. Now, this man sitting there in that little room near the temple, nobody knew him. Hardly anybody knew. Many famous people came, met him and went away. His sadhana was pure devotion to the feet of the mother. Later on, of course, after he had had the darshan, the ultimate darshan of the Supreme in the form of the mother, he learned other disciplines. He learned Vedanta, he learned Tantra, he learned Vaishnava Tantra, Bhairavi Brahmini, and so on and so forth. Tatapuri is Vedanta. But this is his starting point. See the life of a person like that, who almost lived with no ego, one side. I'm going to tell you about another person. There was a young man living in a small uh, village, not far from the South Indian uh, state of Madurai in Tamil Nadu. He was not very bright in his studies. His name was Vengatramana. He lived with his brother. The only peculiarity they noticed that when he went to sleep, it was very difficult to wake him up. Not a good example. Again, he slept like a log. And then, when he was around 15 years, 14, 15, he was not doing any sadhana. One day he had a strange experience. He thought that he was going to die. So he lay down like a dead body. As they take the dead body to the cremation ground, he said, this is how it is. Then he suddenly found that the body was dead. I mean, almost like looking like dead. And he was not the body, but someone else looking at it from outside. So he said, then this is not, I can't be the body because the body is dead. They are going to take it to the cremation grounds, but I am very much alive. So he started asking himself, if I am not the body, who am I? I am talking to you about a different approach in Sadhana. That is one approach, this is another approach. And that set him off from home. He left home. 
leave a letter saying that I am in search of my father and left. And his constant meditation was, if this is not what I am, who am I? It developed, went deeper, went so deep that he went to a small place called Patara Gufa, underground, in the Tiruvannamale Shiva temple. And there were scorpions, hundreds of scorpions who beat him and hanging on to his body. He was not aware. You know, there are lots of people who sit up and say, who am I, who am I? One mosquito bites enough, who am I is over. <laughs> so it's a different kind of sadhak, different kind. He went so deep into the understanding. And finally he came out and said, he summed up the entire essence of Vedanta in one sentence saying, Deham, Naham, Koham, Soham. Another kind of sadhak, another approach. Right? Now, third example. I'm giving you examples because you understand. If I keep on lecture, I can go on for two hours. Require some water, but uh, another Swami Vivekananda. Now, everybody considers him as the chief disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. But in no way was he like Ramakrishna. He was not a clone. You know what I mean? Ramakrishna, this is how a true spiritual teacher is taught each one according to their capacity, according to their movement, according to their nature. And all of them, whoever he touched, attained something in their own way. Here was a man who was a total rebel, who came from the Brahma Samaj, who did not believe in idol worship in the beginning, who stayed with this man who was a worshipper of Kali, Mother, and gradually discovered the truth. Here was a man who broke no nonsense, pretty straightforward, said the truth as it was, iconoclast par excellence, broke all images. I mean, not physically breaking images. And yet, Ramakrishna decided that he would be the leader. He didn't say somebody who imitates me will be the leader. It's not imitation and outer things that are important, but each person has to reach that according to their nature. It's futile to tell someone who enjoys life in different ways. You give up everything and take sannyas and go and it won't work. Therefore, the great science of Tantra, well, it has a bad reputation nowadays, but it's only a reputation. It's, it, it has a lot of essence in the teachings. They say that everybody cannot attain moksha. So enjoy, discover, find out, and then discard. The only thing is mostly nobody discard, they're stuck to it. So, different kind of sadhana. Now, just see how this great teacher dealt with two disciples, several disciples in several ways. One day, uh, one of his disciples, who was a very uh, militant kind of person, I think Niranjanananda, who became Niranjanananda, crossed the river in a boat. And when he was in the boat, people started rebuking and uh, insulting him, his guru, that thought, Brahmin priest who is living there, what does he think, ah, spoiling all youngsters. Ah. So when he got off the boat, he got out and before the others got out, he tried to tilt the boat and said, don't speak like that again. 
And then he came to Thakur to see him. He didn't say a word. Just sat down. Thakur said, who are you to defend me? <laughs> who do you think you are? Why are you defending me? People will say what they want. This is not the right approach. Okay. Then, what? Dealing with one person. After some days, Swami Premananda went, who later on became Premananda, who was really like Prema. Never, if you can insult him, but he wouldn't do anything. He would just listen. So, in the port, they criticized Thakur. He didn't say a word. Came back, went to see Thakur, he said, what kind of a disciple are you? <laughs> They criticized me and you kept quiet. <laughs> so, what I mean to say is that a true teacher like that knows that people are made differently. Therefore, there are different approaches to truth and what is less should be added and what is more should be reduced. This is one type of sadhak one type of teacher, different ways of dealing with different people. Why? Because we are all, even though in essence we are the Supreme, essence we are a spark of the Supreme. Let's be more humble about it. Huh? But, uh, outwardly, due to our past births, due to our this births, experiences, background, we are different. So the moment I say I am only right and everybody else is wrong, we are in trouble. Very different approaches. And truth is so extraordinarily infinite that it is not possible to define it in only one particular mode. As many ways of looking at it, so many ways you can look at it. Now, since we mentioned Yoga Shastra, the Bhagavad Gita contains 18 chapters and each one is called a Yoga. It's not only the Yoga which you do, which is good for health also. I mean, normally uh, it's better than other kind of physical exercises, I think. And it also deals with the endocrine system and puts it in order. And therefore, Patanjali in his Yoga Shastra, after defining yoga as Yoga's Chitta Vritti Nirodha, the famous definition of yoga according to Patanjali, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Now, Chitta is the mind. Mind cannot be conscious without prajna. Prajna is, this, is the atma that makes the mind conscious. But the mind cannot exist as long as there is no thought. Mind cannot exist. When you say mind, it's thought. If I say, I'm free of all thought, I'm thinking. Some people like to think, see, now I have no thought. Who is thinking? The nature of the mind to think. So, without thought, there is no mind. It's a collection of thought. So, chitta vritti nirodha means vrittis are the thoughts or the movements, the waves in the mind stuff. Patanjali said, if you can remove those vrittis, it's not possible to take them off at one time step by step, slowly, slowly, because all the vrittis are created and sustained by the senses that are in contact with the world. Therefore, they have to be, they will be there. If you can slowly look at them, handle them, see how to keep them away from those sense organs which create the complicated ring, then one day, they disappear. And when they disappear, 
the mind is still there but it has no peace then what remains only the purusha this is why patanjali said chitta vritti nirodha because that mind which is free of the distracting thoughts basically awareness is there but the distracting thoughts that prevent the awareness of the being when this has been done that is the tarmac from which to take off to the higher regions important now in a case of a person who does not practice yoga let's say i mean yoga in the conventional sense of the term who is not breathing in and out i mean deliberately everybody is breathing in and which stops we are gone or for example the devotee is so absorbed in the lord that there is no place for any other sort out there then the prajna takes over there is no thought not no self created thought all the thoughts that come in are those which are conduce you to the inner being and then also one touches that reality what does the vedantin do eliminates all that is not real by saying not this not this not that is one way it's an extreme way not easy theoretically it is easy to say but it is very easy, difficult to practice neeti neeti not this not this finally when you can no longer reduce you have come to the essence the truth how does the bhakta do like that he has nothing else to think other than the deity everything is gone except that how does the yogi do it he consciously systematically step by step through kriya or so when i say kriya yoga please understand that kriya in sanskrit simply means a technique and there are innumerable kriyas in the yoga shastras when we say kriya we are talking about that particular technique which has come to us from sri guru baba ji and for me through my sona which doesn't mean that there are no other kriyas in the yoga shastras there are many vastrika is also a kriya right and so on so in the yogic science as it has come down to us we are well aware that the mind cannot be silenced this moment i attempt to silence the mind it rebels and comes back with full force i am not such a devotional person where i can absorb myself on the feet of the lord and do para seven and forget about everything else suppose i am not i don't have that capacity what do i do as i am a practical man i like a systematic movement towards it okay that is yoga what it means is that in kriya for instance we have found out the intimate link between the mind and your breath breath is a common factor we all breathe don't we breathe man or woman small or big russians ukrainians they all breathe <laughs> now Chinese also breathe. <laughs> Nobody breathe. One minute of no breath is death, unless you are a yogi, of course. So, is breath is such an important part of our life? We don't give any attention to it. No attention. We even don't know how to breathe properly. Through all this COVID. i was doing most of the internet talks trying to teach people to breathe properly which doesn't require even a medicine to do if you breathe properly there is very little chance of you being invaded by anything including a virus and that to a virus which goes straight to your lungs if you can keep your 
the bronchioles, which are the cells in the lungs, fully irrigated with oxygen. We don't need a cylinder. Cylinder can some can some cases be adverse. So breathing. So give him great importance to your breath. Because it is the link between look, you can few days stay without food. Hopefully. You can uh, also stay without drinking water for some time. You cannot stay without breathing for more than a minute. So how important is the breath? And you don't say breathe, it happens automatically, right? And therefore it automatically stops when required. Yogis count their lifespan according to the number of breaths actually. That is the yogic science of pranayama. Now, which means if they think that job is over and everything is over, a real yogic practice decides, okay, how many times have it? Okay, enough. Another 10 more breaths and gone. I've seen this happen before my eyes. My Sonat Babaji left his body, making me a scapegoat, saying, now you do that, some work, I'm going. And what did he do? I, this is something I've seen with my own eyes. He just stood up, turned around four directions, sat down and did, <laughs> and gone. Now, this is what a yogi can do. If you learn the science of yoga, in which the central part is pranayam. Pranayam also means the rules and regulations of prana, how it operates in the system. It is a very scientific study. I am attempting to bring it into main, what is it called? Not main, mainstream science by trying to find out instruments and things which can measure the body's reactions to breathing, different rates of it and so on. We try. Because everybody wants, you know, lab proof. Except one being you cannot put in the lab, the supreme being, but other things. So, uh, this Ranayam works on the principle. Two principles. One is, that the mind cannot stay empty. It needs to be occupied. Generally, it is occupied in outward things which are part of the panchendriyas, the five indriyas. If you can give it something inside, yourself, to which it can be coupled, thought, then it will free itself from the outside distractions and settle down in the inner thought. What inner thought? Some people can think of the deity or do japa. Even that is not so easy. Pranayam will help you to do japa. Which is why even when you do Sandhya Vandana, Jain the Gayatri, you do a little bit of pranayam to steady everything. Right? You do anilom, anilom, steady everything up. Now, thing is therefore, to find an inner engagement which is, which will free the mind from outer engagement. There is nothing better than your own breath. So what we are practically doing is to turn your attention to the breath and become aware of your breath as you inhale and exhale, which you never are, usually. So, this is a, one of the important parts of Kriya also. You're not just breathing in and out, it's being aware of your breath as you breathe in, and aware of your breath as you exhale. And to consciously make the attempt to have a deep breath, which we call in yoga as ujjayi. Only difference in Kriya is that you, when you exhale, which is not there in many disciplines, exhale through the mouth. 
if you try 10 rounds, you will see the difference. So, in this pranayam, what we do is first we shift the attention of the mind from the outside world through fixing it on the breath. So, when you inhale, inhale with complete consciousness of your inhalation. When you hold your breath, be fully conscious of that holding. When you exhale the breath, be fully conscious of the exhalation. When you do this regularly for a few days, you will begin to enjoy something inside. Keep being aware of the breath as you inhale and being aware of the breath as you exhale and being aware of the breath when you are holding in Kumbhak, you will begin to find pleasant sensations happening inside. Once the pleasant sensations begin, then you are hooked, then there is no problem. Till then, you need to practice and I can't say how long and how many because it all depends on various people and their various characters and various things. But once it becomes steady and you can effortlessly sit every day and do your exercise. And in Kriya we also use the mantra hum so. You can also use so hum, it doesn't matter. In hum, when you breathe in complete, give complete attention to your breath, chant in your mind hum. And when you exhale, chant sa. Hum sa. Hum sa. Actually, the meaning is I am that. Hum sa. But we don't worry about the meaning, just the sound, internal sound. Keep breathing in and breathing out. Since we live in modern times, I have an electronic suggestion for you, which is. Record hamsa in a little, in your cell phone, put on headphones. When you breathe in, hum. When you breathe out, so. Don't make any conscious that you can hear it. Do this for a few minutes. You will see that the breath has become steady and quiet. You begin to enjoy the happiness of a still breath. And there are no other external thoughts intervening because you are fully fixed on this and there is an enjoyment happening inside you which will prove to your subconscious, oh yes, there is also enjoyment here. This is the beginning of the science of Kriya, this hamsa of breathing. Suppose you do japa or some other discipline, first you do the pranayama for some time. We, of course, chant Om, Rim, Shri, Guru, Vyonamaha before we begin. We chant it to Babaji, but Om, Rim, Shri, Guru, Vyonamaha is a mantra for any great teacher. You think of the Padukas of a great being, it can be anybody. It can be Babaji, it can be Maharaj of Akhat Kot, it could be uh, Sai Baba of Siddhi. Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, it could be any. The Padukas are symbols of the seed of the Gurus, the essence of the Gurus. So we usually visualize the Padukas. Chant Om Vrim Sri Guru Namaha and do the Hang song for some time. Till the mind settles down, settles down and begins to enjoy the inner being. Next steps of the Kriya cannot be discussed in public. This much we can. And don't think that this is not enough. Now I am going to tell you two stories. One is about breathing, but the same person. And other is about Hamsa, same person. You, many of you must have heard of the great Shyamacharan Lehri, one of the greatest yogis of his times. Of all time, actually. Lahiri Mahasaya used to live in Banaras most of the time, though he was from here. Two stories. One is about uh, the breath, other is about Hangsa. Because lest you think, oh, more Kriya, we need to learn more techniques. 
this is not enough because we are in a we window shopping. You know, we like to go to the mall and this is not enough because we, one pointed attention to one thing doesn't come. There was a, a professor who was a great uh, disciple of, uh, a devotee of uh, Larry Mahash. So he took Kriya from him. What Kriya did he take? Mahash always gave Hangsa first. So he took the hamsa. In Sanskrit is hamsa. Bengali it is hamsa. Anyway, doesn't matter. See, he took hamsa. And um, he was practicing it. But every week, Sundays, he used to come and bother Mahashai by saying, When will you give me the next Kriya? not knowing that whatever is given to him, if he practices it properly, he will get where he has to get. And but every Sunday he used to come and tell, ah, so when will you give me the next career? Well, he used to keep quiet, sometimes better to keep quiet, especially before professors. So, keep quiet. So, one day, he came and asked the same question. Now, there was a postman whose name was Brinda. Brinda also was initiated into Hangsa at the same time as the professor. So that day, Brinda, later on he became a great youth. He was called Brinda Bhagat. So then Brinda came. Brinda, later on he became a great youth. He was called Brinda Bhagat. So that Brindo came. So this professor is already asking when is the next thing. So Mahasaya called him with Brindo come here. When shall I give you the next Kriya? He put his eyes on me and said, I don't know it anymore. <laughs> I'm enough. Every time I do Hamsa, I'm so intoxicated by the thing going up my spine that my neighbors have begun to think that I'm a drunkard. And I find it difficult to post letters now because whenever I take out, the other day I took out a letter, it said to Sri Narayan Bhatt. I thought of Narayan and I was lost. I didn't know where the letter was. <laughs> Please don't give me any more kriyas, more than enough. Masha I told the professor, you heard. <laughs> it's not that you need to learn more. Now this is about the breath. I made a statement, which is a general statement, that one cannot live without breathing for a, a minute or maybe some little more if you Larry Masha has a great uh, close friend whose son became a doctor. So he was going to join the medical service in the hospital for the first time in Banaras. So his friend said, my friend, uh, Shama Charan is there in Banaras. Before you go and take charge, go and meet him and take his blessings. He's supposed to be a great yogi. So this guy went. And he was sitting as usual in the parlor. He said, who oh, introduced him? Oh, he said, very good, very good. So you become a doctor, yes. He said, I want to ask you, what are the symptoms by which you medical profession defines death? You tell me. He said, sir, first of all, uh, this guy was not aware of your Aoki, this, that, and all. He went because of his father's friend. Take his blessing. He said, first the pulse stops. Then heart stops. Then, then the solar plexus also becomes cold after a while. So clinically, the person is dead. This is our criteria. Oh, he said, okay. So you got you are joining duty, yes. You bag, you have your stethoscope, yes. Okay. So he said, I'm going to meditate. Please use your stethoscope and check me properly, okay? He said, okay. So he sat down in Padmasan, did his kriya, went into Samadhi. This guy took his stethoscope after a minute or so. First he checked his pulse. There is no pulse. Then he checked his uh, heart. 
there is no heartbeat. Then after a while he touched the solar, which become absolutely cold like ice. He started shouting, the man died, he's dead, he's dead. Mm -hmm. So all the relatives came running, what happened? What is the commotion? He said, this man is dead. He said, <laughs> they said cool down, he'll come back after five minutes. <laughs> So after five minutes, Mahashaya opened his eyes and said, this also needs research in the medical profession. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I said you can't stay without breathing more than this time, it simply means people who are not yogis. But then, don't get it into your head that I am a yogi and try to hold your breath for a long time. Definitely get a lung hemorrhage. <clears throat> In this group, if you have anything to discuss now, you may please put up your hand. I'll answer your question in as best a way is as possible. First of all, all that a person can read, a yogi can read, is the blueprint. But the human being, since there is a spark of the divine in the human being, he has the capacity also to sometimes to get over the blueprint. Possibilities are there. So while the general understanding can be read through the blueprint, how does the yogi read the blueprint? Not through any astrological charts or anything of the kind. Uh, we have to be a little careful with astrology nowadays because it's still based on the belief that the earth is the center and all planets are revolving around it. Heliocentric system was discovered long ago. And when the Vedas say Jyotisha is an Anga, they are talking about astronomy, heavenly bodies. How far they have an influence on the physical body, we are not very sure. Some may be possible because people who are crazy become more crazy during the full moon. So there may be something. In this case, how does the yogi find out? Suppose I went to a great yogi. As you said, many yogis who met me, many masters. There is something in the human body, not body, but since the soul is inside the human body. The blueprint of all your past lives is already there in it. The yogi only can read it. You cannot read it. No matter what all calculations you do, you cannot read it. So the blueprint is seen in the emanations that come from you. And uh, emanations, I don't want to use that word because now this is another business, aura reading. Everybody is reading the auras. It's not a joke. It's something which only a real yogi can do. And when the yogi looks at the emanations coming from you, he knows your old blueprint. With that, the way you are today, he puts things together and says, this could be your future. But the part where hard work is required is not taken away from it. Otherwise also you will attain there, but it will take you many more lives. This is the secret. It is only great yogis can do. It is not a calculation. It is something that they see from the aura. Aura is the radiation that comes from your mind and from your soul which can be visible to great yogis. If you see old pictures of saints, you will see a halo there, painted of course. It's the emanation that comes from the inner being that is seen. That's how they found out that, oh, this is what you are going to do next. Even that is not 100% accurate. I could have fallen on the way, but there were compassionate people
being so lifted me up and took me there. You may put it this way. Now since we have said this, I want to tell you a joke. Don't be so serious. Uh, there's a village, there was a village priest, you know, church, parson. In a small church in the village and there was a priest. And uh, he went to the town to buy a, his cycle tube got punctured. Tired, cycle tire. So he got a new one. And he was cycling back to his church. So he put it on his neck. It is in realized how to carry it in sight. So a small boy saw him on the way and said, Father, Father, your halo has fallen down your neck. <laughs> so don't let your halo fall down. Yeah. Anything? Just uh, in your book, you have written that uh, there are some practice to see myself means go beyond the, my body. What uh, you tried? No, no. Just <laughs> uh, my question is that there is one of my sister uh, is there. He can read my mind. So the day I read your book, the very next day he told me that don't uh, practice this without closing the doors Wait. and without closing the doors. And another my friends told that, okay, uh, you first of all, you need to put some gatra bandhana uh, and uh, go keep some secrets. So I haven't tried. So I just want to know that uh, if there is there any dangerous things to do without <laughs> doing that thing. Because two times I was uh, discouraged. Some, yes, discouraged. Because uh, my sister, he read my mind and he just said, you are reading this book. He doesn't know that I bought your books and I am reading. He told me that uh, without closing the doors, don't practice. And please uh, uh, say that. Uh, okay. Now, you might have read about a simple technique which I have described in The Journey Continues. Yeah? Where I have said that this is the simplest technique possible that human beings can practice. To, for not for the Atman, but for the subtle body to leave the Stola Sharira. Yeah, of course, the subtle body is, the Jiva is clothed and with the uh, subtle body, of course. Now, in a way, what they said is true. First of all, I suppose that people will have common sense and close their doors while they do this. How can you lie in an open air or football field and do this kind of exercise? You cannot do it. So you must certainly close your door. There is no question of See, even when you meditate, it's better to close the door because somebody might disturb you. You see, if suppose you succeeded, suppose, and you really came out. If somebody then comes and disturbs your body, you may come back with such a jerk that your whole body will suffer for many days. So, if you attempt the practice, you should certainly make it private. Shut the door. I would even give you one hint. Keep the room dark. Don't put full light. It will never happen. Keep it dark. Because it's only when it is dark that the pineal gland functions well. And this is connected to the pineal. So, darken your room. Shut the door and then practice it. What was the second? Oh, yeah. So there is this fear which actually need not be that when you leave your body, suppose, suppose you do, I'm not sure. Because this is the simplest techniques, it may be possible. There are other complicated methods of doing it with pranayam and so on, which I did not write because it could be dangerous to practice without proper guidance. Now the second thing you asked, ah, there is this general fear that when you leave the body, somebody else might come and occupy it. 
which is why uh, they say some uh, negative forces may enter your body when you are not there. So therefore draw a protective circle and do it. This is where the story comes from actually. But you have nothing to fear like that. You have to be afraid of doing it if you are trying to practice it after having alcohol or after having narcotics. Then what happens? The protective shell that we naturally have around us which is already there is broken. Then there is a chance that something like this might happen. Not otherwise. Do you go to the bar? <laughs> then don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> came out from the body and somebody has touched that body means some third person with physical body like, uh, like one no, no. Like, no. Any nothing person. will happen nothing but will happen only while you are out somebody vigorously shakes your body then you will immediately come back and when you come back you will wake up with a terrible headache and for two, three days there will be total disorientation, which is why it's good to prevent. Keep the doors closed. And if you are traveling out, please come to Madanavali. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't say this. One of the one of the easy way to get your sushma. But why are we doing all this? Let's find the truth. <laughs> anyway. So, one of the easiest ones, easiest ways to move out and is to think of a place which you really would love to go to. Hmm? So, then think, I want to go to Mandapalli, I want to see him, and then imagine all those things. It might be easier for you to come out. And then if you do, and if I am there, then suddenly I will say hello. <laughs> Others may not see it, so not to worry. Hmm? Sir. Uh, pranam, sir. Can I speak in Hindi, please? Of course. So, I will pranam. So, sir, if you are a person, you will be 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 a person, फिर एस्टेब्लिश कर सकते हैं हमारे इंडिया में ऐसे कुछ तरीका बताएं ऐसे कुछ सजेशन हम कर जो कर सकते हैं फ्यूचर ये परिश्रम में हम भी लगे हैं भाई <laughs> ये हम देख रहे हैं कि वेस्टर्न एजुकेशन ठीक है अपनी जगह में ठीक है मगर जो वो आता है कि अपने ट्रेडिशंस वगैरह छूट जाते हैं तो अपना तो मेरा ये प्रयत्न मैं कर रहा हूं मेरा भी श्रम इसी रास्ते पे है कि स्पेशली जो बच्चे हैं यंगस्टर्स हैं जो कॉलेज लेवल के स्कूल लेवल के उनको ये बताएं कि हमारे ट्रेडिशंस में भी बहुत कुछ है जिसको आप किसी ने बताया नहीं आपको तो माता पिता नहीं बताते तो बेचारे क्या करेंगे तो इसके लिए कोई भी काम करता है तो सबसे बड़ा काम है मैं कहूँगा कि ये बड़ी सेवा है भगवान की सेवा है कि हमारे इस राष्ट्र में इस देश में इतने सारे डायमंड्स छुपे हुए हैं तो इसको लोगों को बताना चाहिए कि हमारे पास ये है तो इस निधि को छोड़ के कहाँ घूम रहे हो अच्छा काम है मैं भी इसके लिए ही काम करता हूँ हमारे बहुत सारे लोग इसमें लगे हुए हैं बहुत अच्छा था कि आपने मुझे ये प्रश्न पूछा बड़ी खुशी हुई <coughs> Uh, my question is, I keep observing my breath all day uh, by uh, chanting a mantra given to me. Uh, the problem is at night, I can't stop the process. I continue to observe the breath. I feel very ecstatic and then you it doesn't stop. You, you feel very? Ecstatic. Ecstatic, okay. And then I'm not able to stop observing my breath. 
Mm-hmm. Then sleep is gone, <laughs> disturbed. How do I uh, continue to practice this without having my sleep disturbed? You are lucky. You shouldn't try to get over it. Mm-hmm. Very few people can actually, even while they are sleeping, watch the breath and chant your mantra. It's not easy. If it's happening to you, your sleep, in fact, if you are in an ecstatic way, while you are doing this at night, your body and your cells get much more rest than even sleep. You shouldn't bother about it. Don't try to get rid of it. If you try not to get rid of it, then sleep state which is Shushupti will automatically take over. It doesn't like to be abandoned. So for for a change, you say that I'm going to continue to enjoy this. I don't want sleep will come to you. Try it today. I'm not joking, seriously, I've gone through all this, which is why I'm saying from personal experience that you say, okay, I'm not, I'm enjoying, let it be, I don't want to sleep. You sleep. Okay, sir. But it's a great thing that even when you're sleeping, about to sleep, sleeping, the mantra japa and watching of the breath is going on in you. It is rare. Don't abandon it. Hold on to it. Something must be there in your past, otherwise, why are you. Why is this happening to you? Don't tell me read my aura. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, sir. Sir. I have received Mantra Diksha in Brahma Murth and uh, I am continuously chanting. It's a Shiva Mantra Dikta, which I have received. Okay. Now, one question I would like to ask you is whether this has to be validated by a living guru to be chanted in the years. By so a whether this Mantra Diksha that I have received will have to be validated by a living guru, someone in the body. Um, when you got it from a living guru? No, I got it in my uh, in uh, Brahma Murth. Automatically? Yes. In your mind? Yes. One day, one fine day. In fact, I got it on two days. Is it, uh, is there any background to it? Before that, did you meet any spiritual person? I have been meeting many people. If the mantra is, uh, it's a traditional mantra or something different? It is not. have to tell me. No, no, it is something different. Hmm. But it is a Shiva Mantra which I received in 2015 mm. and subsequently around the 6th that Mantra seems to have just erased and another Mantra came. That also Shiva Mantra. But are you continuing with one or two? I am continuing to present one. Which the second one? Yes. Okay. I don't think you need a validation. Okay. That is what I wanted to know. Mm. Chant it with complete attention and devotion. This I am doing. That you don't need to be validated by that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pranam, sir. Uh, sir, uh, staying in a situation in a family with children, with husband and all, all the works of a household. Uh, sometimes you realize that, or I have realized and I face that in my spiritual journey, what I'd like to do, I would like to do something beyond, you know, move further on in my journey. But certain obligations or duties, you know, pull me back. And then I get into this uh, phase of irritation that I'm not able to move forward. So how do we overcome that, sir? I cannot specifically do, I don't know your specific problems. Mm. If you had attained some level of uh, realization in your spiritual life, early in life, then you might have known how to handle it. I also live in a family, I have kids who are married. I have a wife. Ah, absolutely. It is other things. The Satsang Foundation is a big family. Even I didn't even think of a small family. They're all 
So these problems are all there. I think instead of thinking how to get out of this, better to live in it and develop yourself so that you are untouched by it. You cannot get, can't change your situation. If you let a normal life, I wouldn't advise you now to take sannyas and go and stay somewhere. You will not stay for more than two weeks. So therefore, stay with Try to deepen your spiritual practices so that these do not affect you. You said, I get irritated. Try not to get irritated. Stay there. You know, it's easier to fight within your four walls rather than out in the open space. One would love to do that because one sees some people are outside. So let me, but it's very difficult to do that for a family person. So live in your family. Carry on with your practices, try to go deeper and make sure that these don't affect you. That is the solution that I can give you. Ah, uh, short periods of solitude might help. So, no matter what happens, say that this time I require for my sadhana. So, I am going somewhere where I can spend a week or two and come back. I don't think anybody will object to that. People go to resorts to revive themselves. And since they have nothing to do, they get drunk. And when they come back, they're completely gone. Instead of that, you can go and sit down and meditate and occupy your mind in devotional practices for some time and come back. So this you can do. Don't cut off totally. You won't be able to handle this at this moment, in this period of time. Now I would like to wind up, sorry. Thank you very much. Namaskar. I'm very happy with the satsang because I think most people who are sitting here are in some way or the other seriously inclined towards the spiritual life. Otherwise you won't be here. So I appreciate that, that you I have spent your valuable time to come here and listen to me. Please understand that this is not a talk, it's a satsang. Okay. Thank you. Namaskar. Hari Om. Om Shanti. Shanti. Shanti.